Welcome to the Chasing Dreams podcast. Today, we have Ms. Amber Evans, who is a high school educator with a master's in educational leadership. She is focused on building the brand of Real Life Mona Lisa that identifies the masterpiece within all young women and womankind. Amber's vision is to rebuild the community of the women of color with first addressing the insecurities that blind us from seeing how much of a masterpiece we really are. She is a woman, a wife, a mother, a mentor, and her vision is to build generational wealth for her children while following her dreams. She is a distributor for Total Life Changes, building a life of healthy well-being, and a creator of the Real Life Mona Lisa blog. Welcome to the podcast, Amber. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Excited to have you. So I like to start off all the discussions by asking, what is the dream for you? So uh, for my life in Mm -hmm. itself? Okay. Um, So I have so many. That's hard. That's a good question. Let us us hear all the dreams. Okay. So (laughs) uh, my number one dream is I really want to create um, a life where I'm living purpose-filled. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not just, I'm a giver by nature. Um, I want to feel good about the work that I do on a daily basis. I want to feel fulfilled personally by it. I want to travel the world. So in my mind, I'm in a different country every month. Like that movie, Eat, Love, Pray with Julia Roberts. Okay. Okay. So I definitely see myself doing that one day. Um, You know, and, and and breaking the curses that I know that I've been raised with, right, um, to be better for my children um, and lead them off into a life where they can live more abundantly immediately mm-hmm. instead of drowning in something they don't really want to be be in and then figuring it out later on. I want them to start off on the journey of being able to fulfill their own dreams on a daily basis. So that's my dream. I love it. I love it. I love it. When did you realize the the dream and how has it changed over the years? Um, I think I have always um, realized my dream. So I am a, I am a chronic daydreamer. I don't know if that's a real thing, but but I'm I'm (laughs) right. Um, I'm a chronic daydreamer. So I have always since childhood daydreamed. Like I can be sitting in the middle of class. It could be a class I like. And if something comes into my head, I'm daydreaming, right, about that life that I'm going to live. And I can envision it in my head, step-by-step conversations that are being had and everything. Um, And so my dreams just shifted because of whatever experiences I was going through um, as I was growing. And so I became a mom at 19 Mm -hmm. um, with my first child, my daughter, and that dream shifted the idea of, because I was supposed to go write for Essence Magazine. I was supposed to um, like live in New York City and own a brownstone like the Cosby's. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> that's what I was supposed to do. Um, Switch so, it around a little bit. Right, so then that shifted a little bit. Um, and I was, I was a communications major when I first started in college and then I got pregnant with my daughter and then I was like, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to have my baby on my hip. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, reality kind of hits you and it's kind of like, okay, well now you got to shift a little bit because my daughter, um, I had in a, from a previous relationship, so I didn't have as much support on hand support with her. So I became, you know, full-time working, full-time finishing my degree in school. And then I kind of fell into changing my major from math communications to English literature. And then from English literature, I was like, all right, well, I might as well become a teacher because my mom's a teacher. That's an easy, you know, um, role to take. And then solid. (laughs) Yeah. And I can pay bills. I can take care of my kid. I can do that. Um, So, you know, I kind of fell into teaching. And I remember having a conversation with my um, coworker not too long ago, who's another teacher. She's been teaching for like 30 something years. And I was like, I just feel like there's like a void, like there's something missing. I don't know. And we're talking in the hallway. And she was like, well, Amber, did you even want to be a teacher? I was like, no. (laughs) I said, I was just good at it. 
Right, right. Like I like doing it. I like, you know, you know, when I see the light bulbs go on in my students' head, but I realized that no, I did not always want to be a teacher. And life just kind of started to take me down this path. So I've started um, you know, kind of reinvesting back into my own dreams because I realized I was just investing in everybody else's. Your children, once you have children, you invest in their likes, dislikes, and, you know, everything that you want them exposed to. When you have a husband or, or a spouse or a partner, you kind of invest into what their dreams are. And as women, a lot of times we kind of take the back seat and we say, okay, well, don't worry about it. We'll do, you know, such and such, or will we, I have time for that? And once things kind of start shifting, you realize you don't have a lot of time for certain things. And so you have to start living and finding your purpose to make you happy because happiness really does matter mm -hmm. for, sure. Yeah. for sure and i definitely um one want to appreciate the fact that you you brought that up um because i tend to say like you know go for your dreams and don't put yourself last and you know all these other things but when people see me i'm not married i don't have children on earth you know what i mean so they look at me like well what <laughs> you as a married mother then say no i have to have time for me too um so i just appreciate that perspective <laughs> no no problem i really do <laughs> no problem it's, it's a hard um it is a hard perspective. Oh, no, no, it's not a hard perspective. It's a hard reality to come yeah, in contact to with. To put in place, exactly. Yeah, because you feel it's a mom guilt also. Because mm -hmm. then you feel like, oh, well, if I do this and follow my dreams, then I will miss something of my child's. And I'm that type of parent. Like, I, I want to be at everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want each one of them to feel that mommy gave each of them the amount of time and love and support they needed. Not like one got shysted because you were here first and then the last one was kind of like, figure it out, kid. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you it's, it's a very hard balance, but it's a daily conscious decision as moms we have to make that I'm going to make time to invest this amount of time in myself. And then you kind of talk real close to your kid's face, like, look here, mm -hmm. I'm going to take these two hours and you're not going to call my name. Yeah. You're not going to say anything to me. <laughs> yeah. And finding that balance. Um, but another thing you brought up that is so key, there's a difference between what you're good at and what you're called to do. Yes. So for example, I used to, in my traditional job was retail management. I'm great at that. But I hated it. <laughs> yes. I'm like, how can you be so good at something that you despise? I don't. In every job I've worked at, they always are like, oh, you know, I've gotten promoted quickly. And they always wanted to, they hated to see me leave. You know, all these. Mm -hmm. it's like, I, I can't stand it. <laughs> I don't like y'all. Exactly. I don't like y'all, but I don't like this. <laughs> You know, I'm good at it, but uh, I gotta go. And so when I left left my last employer, there was such a, a shift because one, it was scary to take that leap into full time entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. but it was almost bittersweet. So the the bitter part was like, damn, I'm responsible for my finances, okay. But the sweet part is like, I literally get to wake up every day and do what I love. Mm -hmm. And feel like I'm walking in my God-given purpose. And that's beautiful. It, it is beautiful. It's a huge blessing. And I don't, I try not to take that for granted. Because, like, I still communicate with, you know, some of my old coworkers. And I'm like, hey. <laughs> like, I don't even know, like, how to be but so empathetic. But it's just like, I know a lot of my old coworkers have those dreams. But they're holding on to what they're good at. Yes. For sure. Yes. So I'm proud of you for taking, you know, taking that time to kind of just go back and um, get back to you a little bit. For sure. So how did you come up with the idea of real Mona Lisa? Real oh. life Mona Lisa. Yes. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, so, so two things. My husband, when we were first dating, we... Uh, it's 2020. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have been married for almost 10 years. Oh, wow. Okay. So the first year that we were dating, um, he, he was at my sister's baby shower. And so he was having a conversation with 
um, you know, my mom, you know, trying to basically butter her up and give her her good side. As he should. Because it was only a couple, it was like a month or two new, and he knew he was going to marry me. And I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> but he told my mom that, you know, if he was a famous artist, then I would be the Mona Lisa he would paint. Excuse me. <laughs> So that became the nickname, right? That he calls me his Mona Lisa. So he signs like all my cards. Aww, that, you know, that is so sweet. Um, and so that kind of, you know, it sparked something in me. So I was like, hmm, I like that. And I've always wanted to have some type of, you know, program where I'm working with young girls, especially young girls of color, especially. It's so important. Um, because, you know, our young girls are over-sexualized. Our, our community shoves our girls out to be adults sooner than they need to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but then they're missing all these things in between that get you to the adulthood or being just a healed young woman, right? Um, so I was like, okay, well, this, this could probably work. And then one day I was talking with my old supervisor, Wanda, and she was like, oh my God, because I was telling her about my... Um, idea you know starting this mentoring group and naming it you know this she was like oh my god you just you know sparked like did you watch black girls rock last night i was like no why what happened so she was like um jasmine sullivan has a song masterpiece okay okay and so um in you know in in the lyrics it says you know uh mona lisa you know and so I was like, oh, I listened to the song. And then that kind of became my theme song for it. I had it. Okay. Okay. And at first I was just leaving it as Mona Lisa, right? The Mona Lisa. And then I'm like, well, that's a, that is sometimes people feel that that is like, um, you can't be flawed if you're going to be a Mona Lisa. Correct. Right. Right. You can't. Be, you it can't comes with a level of perfectionism. Yes. That none of us have. Hello. <laughs> none of us have it. Um, no matter how good of a person you are, no matter how, you know, Christian you like to be, it doesn't matter, you know, nobody's perfect. And so I didn't want to put that out there as you have to be this perfect model of like what a Mona Lisa is. So I had to put real in front of it because Jay-Z also has a line in his song, sleeping day, sleeping next to the modern day Mona Lisa, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the reality that we are, all of us as women, no matter how flawed, no matter how imperfect we are, no matter how you know bad our attitudes can be sometimes, mm-hmm. um, the depression, the anxiety, all the things that women go through and carry mm-hmm. on our shoulders yes, Lord. are the reality of situations, but that doesn't make you any less of a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. All those things put together make you a masterpiece, right? And so if we still take real life Mona Lisa and we still add the fact that um, the Mona Lisa is one of, there are two of them, if most okay. people no, right? So there's the European version of Mona Lisa, and then there is the Nigerian painting of Mona Lisa. And Beyonce actually, uh, her and, and Jay Z and their con- and their tour put up they put up the distinction between the two pictures, right? They put they have the black woman Mona Lisa, and then they have the European woman Mona Lisa, um, because all women are you are right a masterpiece of some sort. But everybody doesn't have to be in your presence. Oh. Everybody doesn't deserve a piece of you. Not everybody's one going to get time for the folks in the back who didn't right. really hear that. that. Just one more time. Right. So everybody doesn't deserve to be in your presence. Everybody doesn't deserve to get a piece of your spirit mm. and, and, and be able to, um, you know, have a part of you that they think that they deserve. They don't, not everybody deserves that. Hello. And so not everybody's going to get to see the Mona Lisa. Hello. Not everybody's going to get to come Hello. in contact. Right. Not everybody gets so or deserves, right? The ability to share the same space as you. Why? Because you're not bringing what I'm expecting. You're not bringing what I'm demanding. Because every woman has the right to demand for themselves mm-hmm. what they want. And I think men have the right to do that because I have sons. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but what I demand for myself, you either are going to level up and give me. Or you're going to fall by the wayside. And that's okay, too. Either way. Yeah. But, you know, that's what a real life Mona Lisa really is, right? And then I want to make sure that I, I um, give a platform where women can be vulnerable. Because a lot of times, especially women of color, we're so hard on each other, mm-hmm. right? You always think it's the woman's fault. 
right? Always. It's her because it's her. Cause it's... Like men don't think for themselves. Men don't make decisions. Men don't put you in situations, right? Oh. Um, I've even had to correct my husband several times. Like, mm, no. <laughs> no. You were a jerk. That was wrong. You yeah. can't. <laughs> and, and I tell my daughter all the time, I'm a woman first. Mm-hmm. I'm a woman first before I'm your mother. I'm a woman first before I'm somebody's spouse or wife or partner or friend. I am a woman first. So what I will do is always put you on the right path of looking somebody, looking at somebody as a woman first. Mm-hmm. I don't care what nobody else says. I don't. I will never condone a man. No matter how trash, and some of these, some women, Lord Jesus, <laughs> no matter how trash the character of a woman is, I'm not going to condone somebody disrespecting them. Right. I don't think it's cute. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, it, so every woman has the right, and everyone has the right to grow and evolve and be a real life Mona Lisa. Mm. Now, I tell you what, we can drop the mic right there. That's <laughs> it. Close shop, okay? We can go home. Um, but yes, I, Snaps across the board. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I hope I explained that well so that it's, it's understood. I understood it. And okay. I hope everybody did. But from what I gather, the, the point I would like to highlight is not everybody deserves the right to even look at you. No. Nope. Let alone touch you. <laughs> okay? Now check that. <laughs> but it is crazy how I didn't even know there were two Mona Lisas. Yes. Yeah. Had no idea. And I'm about to go Google the Nigerian Mona Lisa. <laughs> because I'm not surprised because history has become so whitewashed. Absolutely. Uh, that I'm, it doesn't even surprise me how whitewashed it is anymore. Uh, but to know that there's a Nigerian Mona Lisa, ch- I know she's beautiful. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and the crazy thing is, is that most people, it, and she was like lost for years. And mm-hmm. then they found her. And then it was, you know... Um, and some famous like art gallery purchased her to be able to kind of, you know, be put up and things like that. But, you know, the unfortunate part is that because history is so whitewashed, we idolize the other Mona Lisa. Exactly. Without even knowing. Rep- right. Yeah, it mean. doesn't represent majority of the world. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it's just the, um, I think everybody should be represented For in sure. the right way. Sure. Yeah. So what has been the best lesson for you so far? Girl, in life? Um, (laughs) while chasing the dream. Let let's Uh, okay. And then we can actually if if the life lesson is good too. Listen, we might need that also, you know? (laughs) We might. (laughs) Um investing in you matters. For sure. Investing in you matters. Um like I said, it's a very hard uh, task to do. And I make a conscious effort every day to say my affirmations to myself and say, okay, I am going to dedicate, you know, working with work, your university, you are required to dedicate how much time you're going to dedicate to building this. Right. And so I find myself, I may have put down an hour and a half to two hours and I find myself doing it for three hours. Nice. Nice. And I noticed that I have to, I have to let go of the guilt that I am not being a hundred percent all the time for everybody and letting everybody continue to pull from me. Right. So I have this thing where if nobody's ever depositing into you, right. And everybody's just making withdrawals, what's left for you. Mm-hmm. And that's becoming a theme because last week we uh, the the guests talked about that too, like making sure that people are depositing and withdraw. Like you can withdraw if you got a balance in this relationship bank, <laughs> right? <laughs> if not, you know we need to have a different conversation. Absolutely. Um, but I remember I was listening to um, TD Jake speak once, and he's a great business owner. Like a lot of people see him in the the pastoral role, but he's an oh, entrepreneur. So yes. And uh, one day he was asked the the clip I had saw. He was asked like, "How do you do all that you do?" Because you know he runs he runs a mega church. Let's start mm-hmm. there. He does the conferences and books and CDs and music albums and. Oh, like, how do you do all of these things? Plus, he has a wife and, I think, like, five kids or something like that. <laughs> His response was, every day I'm going to let someone down. 
every day I'm going to drop the ball on something. Mm -hmm. It's my job to make sure it doesn't become a habit. Mm. It's my job to make sure it's not the same person every day. And I was like, yo, (laughs) that makes sense. sense. Like, as long as I don't have a habit of disappointing Mm -hmm. me, we're good. I don't have to show up every single time. I just have to show up maybe 95% of the time. Right. And every once in a while, I may have to say no. Um, And my sister and I are 10 years apart. So I've kind of become like her second mother. Mm -hmm. Um, But I remember one day we were having a conversation um, and her father, uh, prior the last couple of years, he's been a lot better. But prior to that, he was very inconsistent, in and out, didn't show up. Um, if he did, it was probably on a holiday, you know, all these things. And I remember talking to her one time. I was like, if we made plans, her and I, if we made plans and I had to flake, how disappointed would you be? She was like, uh, I mean, it, I would understand. Like, you know, it, it's okay. Mm-hmm. And it, if your father made plans with you, and he canceled last minute. How would you feel? She was like, I'd be really sad. And I was like, the only difference in those conversations is I have a habit and a history with you of not canceling. Mm-hmm. And it's been my mission. Like, if I make plans with my sister, I unless I'm in a hospital bed, it's, it's happening. Okay. And because of that history, she would extend me a little bit more grace. Mm-hmm. But because her father at that point of the conversation had a history of not showing up, it would hurt a lot more for him to, again, drop that ball. Mm -hmm. So I think understanding that people can give you that grace and that flexibility to not always be present um, if you have a history of showing up and being present for those people. My daughter taught me that actually within the last two years. And I remember her saying, like, I, I, I had to, I had to do something. I either had a meeting or I had something to do and I was going to miss a basketball game. Mm-hmm. I was at all my kids' basketball games. Like I, I show I'm that parent. Yes. Um, and so I was feeling terrible. I'm like, I'm just sorry. I'm starting crying. I'm like, I'm sorry. She was like, mom, you're always there. It's okay. Mm. And I didn't realize how much she pays attention to Mm. me. Like, my children do not look for me Mm. because they know I'm going to be there. They know you're there. Yeah. Right? So, like, you know, football practice or football, like, my sons would be like, well, where's daddy? I'm like, why y'all keep asking me about him? Like, (laughs) but they, I'm always there. Like, I'm the one at the, the, and plus, my husband works, you know, later time, so he gets home later. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, it's our, it's a routine for them. Mm-hmm. Mommy's home when we get home. Mommy, you know, is going to make dinner. Mommy is going to help us with our homework. Mommy is going to make sure that we get to our practice on time. Mommy's going to sit at practice and read her book. Mommy's going to, you know, it was a routine for them. Mm-hmm. And so I realized, I'm like, oh, these kids kind of know I'm. I'm all right. <laughs> it, it makes it makes a difference um, because I, growing up, I did competitive cheerleading, and competition season for cheerleading is like October through let's call it May, right? I remember and now, my daughter, my elder. Oh God, Jesus! <laughs> and it's like two, three weekends out of the month, and sometimes mm-hmm. travel and all this other stuff. And it honestly wasn't until this year that now I'm coaching. Well, I've coached cheerleading before too, which is crazy. Um, that it didn't even dawn on me until this competition season. But I was like, competition season coincides with tax season. And my mother's an accountant who runs her own business for 20 years. And I, and she didn't, I never felt like she wasn't there. Yeah, for some travel that she did, she traveled sometimes. She traveled didn't, but all of the parents kind of like rotated and shared mm-hmm. chaperone, so I, that felt normal. I was like, okay, um, but I, I never was at a competition and was like, "Where's my mom?" Right. Like I never felt that. And then on top of that, she's running a business whose busiest season coincides with my busiest season. Right. And then on top of that, my little sister was in the mix too, and I'm just like. I, I'm in awe. Right. Uh, How the hell did you do that? <laughs> As a single mother. I'm like, wow. Mm-hmm. You know, like you really, and I mean, I cheered my whole life, you know? So like, and I did competitive cheerleading from sixth grade 
until I until freshman year in college. Lord God bless your mother. Cause I was so glad when my daughter said she wanted to play basketball. I'm like, <laughs> Thank you. I don't have to be at these competitions all day long. They always want to bow at every competition. All day scenario. And not only competitions, but they get me to practices and practice almost every day of the week. Okay. Okay. And so this year I was really, ref- I'm like, when I started realizing like my busy season was coinciding with hers, mm-hmm. which is really crazy that it took me to you know, 2020 to really sit back and realize like, and I graduated high school in 2008. So, I mean, it's literally been 15 years since she's been doing all that she's been doing. And I'm just like, huh, (laughs) it makes a difference. (laughs) It really makes a difference to just know and to be able to not even think about the fact that your mother's going to be there. Yeah. It really helps. And, and I was like that with my with my father. Like, I knew my father was coming. My father showed up to every parent-teacher conference. He was in yeah. the first or second row of every recital, uh, raw, uh, you know, play production, music recital, whatever it was, with his camera. Mm-hmm. And don't let him, and don't let nobody have made him late. Because now he in the wrong seat. <laughs> he over people's heads. You know, to take a picture that he want to take when he want his camera set up right here. Listen, but with <laughs> my mother, unfortunately, I had that anxiety mm. that she was going to be late or she was going to miss it or just it, it was just whatever. Yeah, I never wanted to have, give that feeling to my children. So I, I know that I have overcompensated mm. from my own childhood experiences to make sure my children never felt certain feelings that I felt. And I remember my husband saying, like, you know, you use this is going to be all right. Like, you don't have to put so much pressure on yourself all the time. Um, it's beautiful that he um, not only noticed, but it gave you permission to be okay. Yeah. That's beautiful. He's he's gotten a lot better at that. <laughs> we'll take progress. <laughs> yeah, progress is progress is wonderful. Okay. So with all that you have going on, what do you do to mentally or emotionally regroup? Um, well, I definitely do therapy. Yes. yes Every yes. two weeks. I'm a firm believer in therapists because sometimes you just can't dump all your stuff on family. Exactly. And- you know, friends, whatever. Um, you want an objective point of view that's able to kind of give you strategies. I like therapists that give you strategies. Okay, well, you, you're feeling this, so how can we change our thinking to think, you know, differently, right? Um, I have done a lot more reading. Like right now, I'm in the process of reading the, uh, you know, Atom- Atomic Habits and uh, right. You Are a Badass, right? Um, and I'm reading those books, you know, together and I'm just like marking them up and you know, I've, I've just decided that I'm going to start taking time um, for myself in the morning and in the evening because I have to mm-hmm. um, because I run so much throughout the day when I crash I like that's it <laughs> I ain't got no more head. and I was supposed to have done something this is not getting done I'm telling you now if I sit on my bed this is over <laughs> um, I get it but I definitely have had to start aligning myself and listening to my conscience and listening to that part of me that's saying, this is okay. This is not that. You just need to calm down. You need to breathe through it. I've learned breathing exercises. I've learned how to, I'm, I get a good 10 minutes of meditation. Once I cross over to like 11 to 12 minutes, my hard. brain starts to think of other stuff. And I'm like, oh man. Um, so I try to do those things to regroup. Um, I'm a lot more vocal now with my partner, with my husband on what I need. Mm. Um, because you know, for him, I've always been vocal about how I felt. Okay. About situation. But not what you need in that situation. And that's, that's huge because for no one, I was about to say men are not mind readers, but no one's a mind reader. And when we go into uh, relationships, whether romantic, friendship, any kind of relationship, expecting them to know what we need, Mm -hmm. we're disappointed every time. But if we just take a moment and say, this is what I need. Are you able to meet that need? Mm -hmm. I've had to learn how to do that. Because before I would just get pissed off, like, you know what? And then he knew I was upset. He knew how I felt. 
but I wasn't able to articulate why I was upset because you're missing the need that I, that I have. And so once I learned to do that, you know, he, then he started saying, just tell me what you need me to do because men don't think like that. They just want you to tell them what to do. Right. They're solution driven. <laughs> right. And for me, I'm just like, do you watch what I do? Like, no. You don't see that this needs to be picked. Like, you're not looking? All right. This is what I need you to do. <laughs> they they did not see. I don't and that Lord, and I'm still I'm still a work in progress. Cause let me tell you, cause sometimes I just sit there and I just go like this, like, Lord God, listen to me. Give me the strength. <laughs> And you know, and I take deep I breath, and I say, you know what? This is what I need you to do. And he's like, all right, you don't have to talk to me like that. No, no, I'm not talking to you any kind of way. I just need you to do this. Yeah, <laughs> obviously can tell that it needs to be done. <laughs> and the funniest thing, um, I. I am a very feminine presenting woman. Um, you know, I love my heels. I love my, you know, all that fun stuff. But mentally, I'm. I, I'm a guy. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> and I remember one day I took a, uh, you know, the Facebook quizzes and it was like, what's your gender? <laughs> and it literally said I was 66% male. And I was like, <laughs> that actually makes sense. Like, honestly. But as far as like, just how I I relate to a lot and I, ha- I usually have a lot of guy friends. I have, mm-hmm. you know, female friends too, but I relate most with a lot and like men and I'm just like, I get it. And I think that's part of the reason why I do like have adapted, you know, habits. Like if I need something, I'm going to tell you what I need. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I I don't hold grudges. I don't really, if it doesn't specifically deal with me, I don't think about it. I don't stress about it. And I think I've learned to not hold grudges. Yes. And just to accept people for who they are, but that doesn't mean I need to be near you. For sure. Right. Because we need distance. <clears throat> right. And that but doesn't mean that, I need to be your sure. friend. I just, I know how to move with you now. Right. I, I know what to expect. I used to be devastated. Like, oh my God, how could they be this way? Like, they're like, don't they see this is morally wrong? And, and my husband would just be looking at me like, yo. Just don't talk to them. That's how they are. I'm like, no, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> I need them to know that they're wrong. He's like, but babe, that's how they want to be. You cannot change people. You can't you just, just run accordingly. Right. And I'm just, I was, it took me so long. I swear it took me like the past two years where it started just clicking. Cause forever, I'm just like, oh my God, that's terrible. Yep. Why <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. They didn't think about this, how this would treat, make somebody feel like what? Well, Cause I'm a, I'm a big over, let me tell you something. I live by you treat others how you want to be treated. Okay that is big for me and but I was expecting everybody else Mm -mm. to live like that too Mm -mm. my husband was just like yo that's that's not gonna happen yeah that's (laughs) true and the one thing I would love um the one I guess male mindset that I would love more women to adopt is not taking on the stress of stuff that ain't got nothing to do with you because a lot of us do that and a lot of us will worry understanding you can care about somebody's problems without taking on the emotional responsibility for it. Yeah. That's true. And that decision is a game changer. Yeah. It really is. Like people are like, why are y'all like, I'm, I'm not always in a good mood, but I, for the most part, I'm usually in a good mood. I have a very peaceful life. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I have a very low stress life. And even when, you know, it's easy to say as an entrepreneur, as well, entrepreneurship isn't even non-stressful but (laughs) you know like I just I have a very peaceful life I have a very low stress life um I don't really trip about much and people always kind of be like it comes across as if I don't care about anything but the reality is I do care yeah I just can't take on your problems we can talk about your problems I can offer solutions I can be a listening ear I can be right there with you in that moment but as soon as we hang up this phone it's not my problem. It has nothing. Yeah. It's not my problem. I have lear- I've learned. I'm still actively learning because I'm a lifelong learner. Absolutely. Absolutely. I-, I can do that for people that I'm not close to. For people that I'm close to, I feel like, oh, how can That's I the hardest that? one. Yeah. <clears throat> but then I realized for people that I'm, that, or at least I thought I was close to. <laughs> you see how you, 
You ever have me? <laughs> I didn't get the memo that we wasn't friends like that. I thought we were. Oh, okay, no problem. I'm, and that has become my realization within the last couple of years. Like, oh, shoot. Oh, oh we're not friends. Oh, we're not the friends. I thought, oh, oh well, why do I care so much now? Yeah, yeah. But even for the people you care about, uh, just learning to put that, learning how to care without yeah. putting it on your own shoulders. Yeah. I think that will make a difference as far as our stress management, as far as our, you know, mental health, because the black woman tends to take on the weight of the whole family. And listen, and that's a lot of weight to carry, but we don't have to, we can show up for people. We can care about people. We can support people without the emotional responsibility Right. Of everybody else's problems. And then putting our problems way at the bottom of the list. Right. And then being resentful. Because I ain't got time for my problems. <laughs> and nobody noticed them. You done took on everybody else's problems. They good. Right. And you like, you didn't, me. you didn't even ask me how I was. But I always say to people, like, you need to check on your strong friend. Whoever it is you think is the strongest person that carries everything, you need to at least send them, I don't give a damn if it's a text message. Just I'm just checking you. on you today. I love you. Just wanted to let you know I do. And it makes a difference. It and does. it does make a difference. Absolutely. So what would you say is your number one secret to success? Um, consistency. Look, I'm saying it backwards. Hold on. God. Okay. 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 Please forgive Come me. Through. I apologize. Um, God and yeah. then consistency, right? Yeah. Um, and even if you make mistakes, be consistent with learning from them and be consistent with still just moving forward. You can't beat yourself up. Like I used to beat myself up about, oh, I should have did it this way or oh, I've waited too long. And, 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 and was that a sign for me? And just overthinking situations, right? Instead of just saying just one little step at a time makes still the difference. It's going to get you to the same place that you want to get to, but it's not a race. And, and learn to enjoy the process of your consistency. Mm -hmm. You know, because we, we're, sometimes we're rushing through, we don't even get to enjoy anything that's going on at the time because we're rushing just to get to that goal that we needed to get to. And I just, let me just hit it. And then, um, you know, in the, in the Atomic uh, Habits book, it talks about, you know, you rushing to get to that goal because you think your happiness is there. And Absolutely. you need to be happy until you get there. Right. I've done that so many times. I'm like, damn it, that makes so much sense. Like, I can be happy there. now. You're like, I'm not even that happy. Because then you start <laughs> focusing on the next goal. Mm -hmm. And you didn't, like, I realized, like, once I once I got over the hump of being a single mom and, and I finished my last class and took that last final with my undergrad, I sat in my car and I cried. I was like, this is so hard. I was by myself. And I'm just talking to him, like, this was so hard, God. You have no right. It's like, God didn't know. He never As if he didn't know. <laughs> right. But after that, I'm like, all right, well, what's next? Like, the next day I did that. Right. I didn't even give myself enough time to celebrate those little increments. And I realized I don't celebrate myself. Mm. Like, even, like, my kids would be like, well, mommy, what you want to do for your birthday? I'm like, ah. And then, I just want an ice cream cake. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, ah, you know, I don't need. But I realized I need to start the, the consistency of my little steps and then the consistency of celebrating mm -hmm. my little accomplishments and stop you know, playing down how dope I am. Right. Because you're dope in real life. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right? And I'm For like, sure. you know what? I am. I kind of dope. dope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? But you, it's, it's sometimes you just have to be consistent in recognizing that dopeness. As women, we have to be consistent in recognizing the dopeness that we have, all have, that we all live with. And I realized, like, when you have to do the little intake, you know, quiz for yourself, like, what skills do you have for work university? Mm -hmm. I'm asking other people, like, what do people ask me to do? I, what am I good at? Like, yeah. What do I do well? Like, does this really count? And it all counts. Mm -hmm. It all counts. But I never thought it counted. I thought it had to be something great and big and grander. But it doesn't. My consistent skills of just being dope is going to get me to where I need to be. 
And what's so funny, so I asked that question, um, the number one secret to success. That is a question I ask all of my guests. Mm-hmm. And you're the first person to have the exact answer that I have, which is God. <laughs> I, view, I view God as my business partner mm-hmm. and I'm incredibly consistent. And I tell my uh, coaching clients all the time, I'm like, I would rather you work 30 minutes a day than for you to work one time, four hours, and then be done. Right. Like, I would rather you just have that consistent habit. And when people ask me, like, I've published a book every year for the last three years. I'm coming up on book four. I've, you know, been in business for four years. I'm, you know, I'm always doing these speaking engagements and I always have products. Like, there's so much that I do. And people are like, how do you do it? I'm like, I'm consistent. Mm -hmm. For the last three years of my business, every day, I do something that benefits my business. Every day. Some days it's 10 hours, some days it's 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. But every day I do something to move the needle a little bit closer and a little bit closer and a little bit closer. And it's kind of like working out. Like if I went to the gym once a year, I wouldn't see no results. Right. But if I did 15 minute workouts every day. You see those little, yep. And I hate working out. And there you are. You're just like, (laughs) Right. Let me get you this 15 minutes and God. That's it. This workout. And then, all right. (laughs) You know, Um, but I just found it interesting that you said God and then consistency, because that really uh, wholeheartedly is my Because nothing to me, and I'm not, I'm not a religious person, Mm -hmm. but I am an extremely spiritual person. I definitely think God, you know, not think, know and believe God speaks to me through situations, Mm -hmm. through people. I have always had somebody speak to me no matter if it was a stranger that I just met at a basketball game, whomever it was, I've always had a stranger speak to me or somebody close speak to me and give me what I needed to hear in the moment. Yep. And then I'm always like, Oh, all right. Thank God. And when it comes from a stranger, you know, it's God, you just be like, Oh, you don't even know what's going on, but you, but I needed that. (laughs) Thank you. You don't even know what you just did. Like when my coworker, me and her are not close, but when she said to me, you know, well, what are you waiting for? Like, what are you waiting on to start your dreams? I was like, I don't know. You're right. I'm going to write something down. Like, write the vision, make but it point. That, but God will always put people, places, things, situations in your life to open your eyes for you to be able to see and go closer to the purpose that he has for you. And every morning I wake up, Every morning I ask God, God, let me be better than the day before. Allow me to move and work in your purpose. Since I'm still in the classroom, you know, I say, let me, you know, pour into my students whatever they need from me. Lord, let me provide it for them just today. And then I ask again for it the next day. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know what they may come into my classroom needing that time. Yeah, exactly. For sure. For sure. So this has been a great conversation. What final thoughts do you have for the audience? I just that, you know, in order to tap into the the masterpiece that we all are, we have to align ourselves with something that is bigger than us. Right. So, you know, sometimes we get lost in trying to find that purpose. Well, what is it? What do I need to be doing? Or maybe this is what I need to be doing. But if we be still, God speaks to us when we are still. Mm hmm. And especially during this time and this chaos of what's happening in the world, Hello. God is speaking through nature. God is speaking through disease. God is speaking through everything. Our children, our families, whatever it is, he's speaking to us. And so sometimes we have to get still so we can hear him. Hello. And I've had to learn that. And, and not feel bad about your mistakes or your flaws or that you're not good enough. Because he already, he already know that. He's watching. Right? Yeah. So, you know, for you to be, you know, that real life Mona Lisa, it's okay to be flawed, but know that you are a masterpiece, know that you are marvelous, know that you are special, know that God is your father, you are a child of God. And so who can stop you when you tap into what God has for you? Absolutely. Um, So that's my message. And that's a message that I always want to try and, you know, put out there. Mm-hmm. whoever I speak to and come across, whether it be a teenager, somebody my age, somebody older, you know, I've, I've always loved sitting next to 
my elders and mm-hmm. getting their wisdom and, and hearing their stories. Sometimes they're just so fascinating. They're such good stories. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to be a blessing to somebody's life on a daily basis, whomever that may be, in mm-hmm. whatever form it may be. Um, and so everybody has the ability to do that. For so, sure. so where can people find you? So I, uh, my Instagram is R, uh, RLM underscore real life Mona Lisa. Um, I have my blog, um, the real life Mona Lisa blog, um, which is attached to the link in my Instagram on my Instagram account. I, um, do a blog posting about, um, every other week, um, as I'm getting kind of into the flow of things and getting feedback and, and I would love for people to subscribe and, um, let me know what you think. I talk about, you know, forgiveness. I talk about, you know, you not getting the apology that you think you deserve. And then how do you move on from not getting that apology? Because okay. sometimes people just want their pain acknowledged, right? But well, it may not. Are you saying that pain? Right. Um, you know, so I, I try to open up to, you know, as many people. <laughs> I'm so sorry. We have another guest. <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. I apologize. Um, so please, you know, look me up on Instagram. I am on Twitter. But I don't really understand Twitter yet. Okay. Okay. So when I get to understanding Twitter, I will definitely have that link connected to my Instagram. Instagram is what I am knowing and understanding. Yep. Um, that Twitter, I still don't get it. I don't understand the purpose. <laughs> I don't understand the purpose of the tweet. Um, maybe I'm always it. I don't it's know. A bunch of people thinking out loud. There's really no other way to describe Twitter. It's just everybody thinking out loud and allowing people to hear their thoughts. Okay. That, that's really what Twitter is. Okay. <laughs> that, I mean, but that makes sense. I just, I don't know. I'll get with Twitter. I don't know. Um, but yes. Yeah, so, you know, I am also, you know, uh, Total Life Changes uh, in a network marketing business where I am learning, uh, you know, and, and living and changing the journey of my health and building wealth at the same time. Um, you know, all natural plant based products that I use and I am a skeptic. I will research the hell out of something a million times before I take it, buy it, order it, whatever. Um, and the products really do make a difference in how you feel on a daily basis because they're all natural and plant-based. Um, so check me out. Um, I've had such a fabulous time joining. This is my first podcast appearance. I'm so excited. Sorry about my doggie. Um, (laughs) um, but this was exciting and, you know, I am looking forward to many more opportunities and working and building with many more women. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being a part of the Chasing Dreams podcast. Um, This was a great conversation. I'm sure the audience has learned so much. Um, And until then, we'll see you guys next time.